Thank you. Uh, really great pleasure to be invited to talk to you today about my research, which focuses on, on diet and health. Now, um, a poor diet is the leading risk factor for ill health in the UK. And that doesn't include the additional contribution of obesity, which comes not much further down the list. That's not the view of a nutrition evangelist. This is the Global Burden of Disease study. And I think we have to recognise that at a national level, a poor diet is a more important risk factor than smoking or hypertension. And yet I put it to you that it receives far less attention as part of our healthcare system, and hence the somewhat provocative uh, title of my talk today. I do think that diet and obesity is one of the Cinderella's of medicine. And I want to use this opportunity to show you some evidence which I think tells us that if we focused a bit more on this area, we could make a very real difference to people's health. So my research group really seeks to develop and test interventions which can be effective in supporting individuals to make dietary change. There are lots of areas where we know what we want to achieve. Less saturated fat, less sugar, less salt, more fruit and vegetables. The really crucial missing piece is the behavioural science which helps us to develop interventions which are genuinely going to be effective. Now, primary care, as it happens, is a great place to do this kind of research because 80% of people visit their GP at least once a year. And given the scale of the problem, we've really got to fix our minds on interventions which can be delivered at scale. This is a place for industrial scale commissioning. We're not talking about fancy boutique interventions which require you to see six specialists ten times a year. We need things that can be done by generalists. And that's why uh, primary care is such a, a good place to start. These are some of our ongoing trials. I sadly can't yet tell you if they're actually going to be effective. But I'm encouraged that this kind of area of interventions delivered by generalists at scale is a really important and potentially uh, valuable one because of the success we've seen in our work going down exactly this line in relation to obesity. And I want to focus on the results of those studies today. Probably don't really need to bang home the point that obesity is probably the most significant public health issue we face. One in four adults are clinically obese. And although you might try to persuade yourself that maybe that's stabilising, actually the onset of obesity is ever younger. One in ten children are clinically obese when they start school. And even more shocking, that is strongly socially patterned. And so children in the most deprived area are twice as likely to be obese as their rich friends. And those inequalities underpin later health outcomes. So obesity is bad news for individuals, but because of the health consequences, it's also bad news for the NHS and bad news for the economy because of reduced productivity. So we've been focusing on... a. Uh, what works? And the answer is, there's a lot of interventions that work really rather well. And I think there are genuine grounds for optimism. Of course we need to get better at prevention, but when we've got one in four people who are already obese, prevention alone is not enough. It's got to be complemented by treatment. So we've conducted a series of large-scale randomised control trials. I'm going to show you just uh, three of those today. So here we compared very basic resources to encourage a self-help approach to obesity with the offer of referral to a commercial weight management group, basically Weight Watchers. And we offered people the chance to do that, paid for by the NHS, for either 12 weeks, which is what the NHS does offer in some areas of the country, um, or an extended treatment period for a year. Obesity is a chronic, relapsing condition. It's probably a little bit optimistic to think 12, year, 12 weeks is enough. And so this was the, this was the trial which we uh, published last year. Two-year follow-up, and what we showed is that over two years, on average, the weight loss in those three groups was two, three, and five kilograms. And what's absolutely clear is that for an individual, longer treatment is definitely more effective. And we saw, associated with that weight loss, proportionally greater improvements in cardiovascular risk factors, particularly a reduction in HbA1c, a measure of the risk of diabetes. But of course, treating people four times longer is, of course, much more expensive. And so the key question for the NHS 
is how do we get the best value for money at a societal level? And that's where the cost-effectiveness analysis becomes incredibly important. So looking at this in strictly economic terms, what you see here in the hatched bars is the costs of the programme. It's four roughly four times more expensive for the longer programme. But what you see in the white bars is the health costs averted. These are the savings that accrue. Because preventing, uh, treating obesity today is about preventing disease later. So yes, there's an upfront cost in year one, but if we model this over the next 25 years, what we see is significant cost, uh, cost savings. And if you put those two together, you can look at the net cost to the health system. What you see is that, interestingly, a 12-week course is cost-saving for the NHS over 25 years. Almost nothing we do in the NHS is cost-saving. It's astonishingly good value. But even that longer course, which is better for individuals, is very cost-effective by classic, nice cost-effectiveness thresholds. £2,500 per quality compared to the nice threshold of about 20000 now, of course, more weight loss would be better. And uh, some of you will have had a sneak preview um, of our latest trial, uh, which was shown in the big BBC documentary a couple of weeks ago, still available on the iPlayer. Um, what we did in this was to look at a total diet replacement. So in this intervention, over eight weeks, we completely replace all people's usual food and drink with specially formulated, nutritionally complete soups, shakes, and bars. And we also give them some behavioral support, partly to stick to it in the first place, but then also support to come back to a healthier eating pattern. And what you see in the trial that underpinned this program is this. The people who had the total diet replacement program lost 10 kilos by the end of one year. We were only seeing them, remember, for a very short period at the beginning, eight weeks on the diet, four weeks coming back to usual food. Um, but one year later, they were 10 kilos lighter, and that was seven kilograms more than people referred to the practice nurse, which is effectively usual care for weight management. I think these are phenomenal results, and these can be delivered by generalists by referring to a provider who is a specialist. A few minutes of doctor's time motivating patients that this really matters is sufficient to encourage them to engage in the programme. So what I think we can be very clear about is that providing support to people who want to lose weight and who volunteer for trials is undoubtedly absolutely worthwhile. But clinical guidelines say we should go much further than that and that we should be proactively identifying people who are overweight and offering them a weight loss intervention. But the sad fact is that that kind of intervention is very uncommon. This is data from electronic primary care records and rather dismally it shows you that less than one in ten people who are obese are offered any kind of intervention uh, to lose weight. So we decided to take on that challenge and uh, we published, the, well we completed and then published the first ever trial of opportunistic screening and offering interventions for weight loss in routine primary care. So we trained doctors to make a very brief 30 second intervention at the end of a routine consultation. So people came with their ingrowing toenail or their bad chest or whatever it was, they came to see the doctor. But if they were obese, at the end of the consultation, the uh, doctor spoke to them about their weight. It was a trial, so we randomised people to one of two arms. One was simple advice. It'd be really good for your health if you lost some weight, which is what we think doctors are somewhat inclined to say, if they're going to say anything at all. And the second arm, the active intervention, was to offer people referral to a weight loss programme. And I think the results were absolutely dramatic. 77% of people who were not remotely considering losing weight, but when their doctor suggested it, said, yes, doctor, I'll do that. Now, people do like their doctors, they tend to say yes. So more realistically, 43% of them actually attended the programme, and around half of those completed the whole 12-week course. So that when we did a strictly intention-to-treat analysis, that's absolutely everybody, whether they said yes or no or turned up or didn't, the average weight loss at one year was two and a half kilos. That was one and a half kilos more than, more than control. And what's 
even more important, I think, is that only one in 500 patients said it was inappropriate or unhelpful for their doctor to talk to them about their weight. And I think that should provide tremendous reassurance to clinicians because one of the reasons they tell me that they don't intervene is because they're worried that patients will be upset and, and, and offended by that. In fact, patients find it helpful when doctors offer them support to lose weight. And I think that's the crucial bit. Let's not blame people for their weight. Let's not tell them they're overweight. They know that already. What we need to do is offer support from an intervention that we know is effective. And we've gone on to work with PHE to develop some resources which will hopefully help more doctors to adopt this approach. And I hope we'll move beyond simple leaflets over the next year. Now, the outstanding worry when I talk to people about this is they say, well, OK, I accept that. People can lose weight. But they just put it back on again. And, you know, the sad fact is that many people do. But the rate of weight regain is perhaps not as quick as many people imagine. And also, a proportion of people continue to do very well. So if we look at some of the big trials that have been done in the last few years, typically around about a quarter of people retain a weight loss of at least 5% five or more years later. So some people continue to do very well. But I want to just give you two examples to show that even if, on average, people do regain weight, that the impact of that weight loss is incredibly important. So we're doing a systematic review of this. I'll be able to give you a more comprehensive view later, but just two examples. This is the Diabetes Prevention Program. Initial uh, weight loss in the intensive lifestyle intervention group of about seven kilos, gradually regained. So four kilos from the start, four, four years from the start, there was no diff significant difference in weight between the control and the intervention group. But look at the impact on diabetes. 15 years later, the incidence of diabetes was reduced by 27% in the group who had lost weight, even though they'd gone on to put it back on. And that compares with just 18% in those who uh, had metformin. The second one looks at a very hard outcome. It looks at, at premature mortality. And this looks at death rates in trials of behavioural interventions. Nice review from Alison Avenel's group in Aberdeen. 34 randomised control trials. What you see is the risk ratio is 0.82. That means there's six fewer deaths per thousand in people who are entered into the active arm of a, uh, for a weight loss intervention compared to control. So losing weight, even if you put it back on, is still worthwhile. And of course, if you don't lose weight in the first place, there's no chance at all that you're going to be one of that 25% who keep it off long term. So what I hope I've shown you in this brief sort of whistle-stop of, of evidence is that we really do know how to treat obesity in ways that are clinically valuable for patients and they're cost-effective. But the really sad fact is that these, by and large, have not at least not yet, changed policy and practice. And in my team, we've been thinking really hard about what else do we need to do? Because clearly, evidence alone is just not enough. And some of the issues that we think are, are important is for us to do much more work with policymakers to help them to understand this point that treating obesity is about preventing later disease. And this, this really does offer us an opportunity to at least attenuate the rising healthcare costs that we face in the NHS today. I think we also have to do more work with health professionals to really elevate the status of obesity treatment. It's not a medical specialty. It's sort of involved in a lot of different areas, but it somehow gets pushed to the bottom of the list. Even in diabetes, we're very good at checking eyes and feet and doing a whole raft of other things, but very often patients are not offered an effective weight loss intervention. And at the end of the day, we also have to bolster some public support for this kind of area. Despite the fact we all know somebody who is struggling with their weight, when you ask the public about how NHS resources should be invested, I'm sorry to say that actually obesity treatment isn't particularly popular. So if there's uh, one thing that I uh, want you to... Well, I want you to remember from this talk is that a brief intervention even if it only resulted in one and a half kilos of weight loss at one year, 
if we did that every time an obese person saw their GP on at least one of those occasions a year, the modelling shows we could halve the prevalence of obesity by 2035. Now, OK, that is a little bit overambitious. Not every doctor is going to do it every time. But I'm encouraged by the fact that 20, 30 years ago, actually most doctors didn't talk to their patients about stopping smoking. Whereas now that is absolutely seen as a routine, established part of medical care. And I remain optimistic that we could achieve that for obesity too. I think far too often the prevailing narrative is that uh, patients are blamed for not losing weight. Where in fact I think there's reasonable evidence that it's the system which is failing by not offering people support in order to be able to lose weight. And so on that note, I'm really genuinely thrilled to be uh, appointed to the Academy and I hope it's an early sign that the tide is turning and obesity is beginning to be taken seriously and uh, just maybe Cinderella will get to go to the ball. Um, so on that note, uh, I have to also say thank you to uh, all my co old colleagues in Cambridge, my current colleagues in Oxford um, and many collaborators around the country. And, of course, most of all to my family, who uh, put up with uh, my work overflowing badly into my home life in uh, many and varied ways. Thank you.